Greetings, everyone. Um, my name is Cullen Hendricks, and I am a professor at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver, and I am also a specially appointed professor at Hiroshima University with NERPS, or the Network on Research, uh, sorry, um, <clears throat> Education and Research on Peace and Sustainability. I'm going to be guest moderating today's webinar. Uh, thank you all very much for attending today's iteration of the NERPS webinar series. The series explores the relationships between peace and sustainability in the context of environmental, sociopolitical, economic, and technological transformations. Uh, NERPS is centered at Hiroshima University and produces innovative inter- and transdisciplinary projects on peace and sustainability with a wide range of international collaborators and stakeholders. Today's featured speaker is Dominique Staler. Dr. Styler, excuse me, is a senior professor of management, leadership, and psychology at the Grenoble School of Management in France. An extremely diverse set of life experiences, ranging from working in social rehabilitation to flying fighter jets for the French uh, fleet air arm, inform his research and teaching on wellness and mindfulness in the workplace, as well as the topic of his presentation today on economic peace. He is also a research fellow at the Center for Theological Inquiry in Princeton, New Jersey in the United States. We are also honored to have Professor Kimitaka Nishitani serving as discussant. Dr. Nishitani is professor at the Research Institute for Economics and Business Administration at Kobe University, where he also earned his PhD. Professor Nishitani has published extensively on sustainability management and social and environmental reporting in leading journals, including the Journal of Cleaner Production, the Journal of Environmental Management, and Sustainable Production and Consumption. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both very much for joining us today. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you to be there with me today. I'm so proud to be with you because uh, we started the relationship only a few weeks, a few months ago with NERPS. And that's really an honor for me to, be, to have this time and this place to speak with you about what we call economic peace, as it is certainly one of the biggest challenge I had in my life. So I'm effectively a professor at Grenoble Business School for the last little bit more than 20 years. Um, and that was something like uh, very strange for me because my education was, as you said, Colin, not exactly in management initially, even if today my, my PhD is in management, but I could say to start this presentation that the main topic I am working on for the last 30 years it is what I call today between strengths and vulnerability, between power and fragility. And I will certainly speak about this when I, when I will speak about economic peace. I would like to start my presentation with this. It's certainly a bit strange to, to, to start with blood when I, am, I have to speak about peace, but um, that's um, a short story. I was on my way to do a presentation in front of some medical doctors in France and a guy sent me a text and he told me, I, I don't know him at that time, and he told me, uh, dear Professor Steiler, you are certainly someone who is very clever in well-being at work, but I can tell you something. If you want to do business, you have to accept uh, that there will be blood on, on the walls. That was very interesting to start, uh, to start the presentation with blood uh, or with war or with competition. And I'm not here to judge that guy. I just would like to send you a first question. I don't need an answer now, but the question is, where do you think that this main idea is within you? Where there is something within me that say to myself every day that if I want to achieve something, I have at a certain way to be aggressive. Um, what I wanted to point with this idea is certainly that in the main field of economy or in the business setting, this is a kind of a framework. I have to be aggressive. I have to be competitive. I have to be above the other if I want to achieve, if I want to success. And of course, economic peace is speaking about another story. Um, why do we start something about economic peace in a business school? Because um, as you can imagine, starting something like this in a business school 
Imagine that in 2008, when my colleague and I went to the board of the school to request the, the opportunity, the, the authori authorization to start such a center on economic peace. Uh, and we started with economic peace, with mindfulness, with well-being, with kindness, with compassion. You can imagine the reaction of, uh, of the board of, the, of a business school. That's a real a big challenge to do that. But hopefully, uh, some CEOs were here to support us. And I will just explain you the, the starting points of this, uh, of this center. The first question or the first, the first moment was with one of my colleagues when we started to say stop. We do not want to hear every day that we are in an economic war and that we cannot do another way. Uh, we do not want to continue to say our students, the future manager, the future leaders, that if they want to win, they just have to compete, they just have to be the strongest without any weaknesses, without any sensitivity, and, uh, and, they, will, and they will be the best in the world. We don't want to hear that if we want to win, we have to accept that some people will disappear that some of them will suffer, that some of them will die uh, eventually. That was our starting point. At the same moment in France, we, we faced with um, a huge suicide wave in different company, but, uh, companies, but especially in, in one big French company. At the same moment, 2008 and 2009, that was the aftermath of the subprimes crisis. And exactly at the same moment, the first CEO contacted me. And this CEO told me, Dominic, if we continue to do business that way, we will destroy each other. What can we do together to try to change something about that thing, about that problem, about that big problem? The second thing he told me was, um, you are a researcher, I'm a CEO, Every time I try to speak about peace, I try to speak about well-being, about wellness, about kindness, everybody is trying to hurt me. The employees are afraid, the unions are, um, they suppose I am trying to manipulate them. My manager told me that we are not here to do social business, but to do, to do money. So it's very difficult for me as a CEO to do something like this. And his request at that moment was, could we create a research center to support me as a CEO, to support me to say that we have to change the way we are doing business. And we have to change that way to ensure that competition or war will not be the aim of the, of the business settings, but peace must be the aim and the common good must be the aim of the, of the business settings. So we went to the board of the school, and that was our first fight for a few months, actually. But I'm today very grateful to, to the Grenoble Business School because that was really, at least in France, that was almost impossible to imagine this. And that school finally gave us a place and gave us the, the opportunity to start it, that, uh, that challenge. Um, at the really beginning of the story, of course, we, we were afraid of something. Can mention you that I was a fighter pilot in the French Navy. And as a fighter pilot and as a specialist in psychology and management on, on personal development, but also us, uh, uh, about stress at work, I had a worry. And, and that's where it was. I want to avoid my children to, to face with the war. When we started to have a look on um, some people who could speak about economic peace at that moment, what we found is what you, what you have uh, in front of your eyes, nothing about peace, but a lot, a lot of things about economic war in French, in Spanish, in English, in Deutsch, uh, in every language we found a lot of books, a lot of papers about why are we in economic war? And, one, and, and why it's like this, it's economic war. I don't know if you can, if you can re read French, but at the left uh, hand side of the, of the slide, there is something that it's called 
Ecole de Guerre Économique in French, that the School of Economic War. For the last 15 years, I tried to contact them and to, to, to request for them to have a time of meeting, to meet together and to think together if we can combine their idea about economic war and our perception of what could be economic peace. And perhaps, as you can imagine, for the moment, that was not possible. They never answered to our question. Other countries have, are, uh, have sorry, some economic war schools. The, US, the USA have one, uh, Spain, I, I guess, also. Um, and our hope of that moment is, was to say, OK, there is some economic war schools in different countries. In these countries, there will be from now an economic peace school, or at least an economic peace center. Oh, sorry. Um, in 2015, when I started my, um, my collaboration with the CTI Center in Princeton, I had a look on who, during the last 100 years, war wrote something about economic peace. I found only few academic papers, actually two, one from 1971, perhaps it's not a, a very important time for you, but in France, that was the first of uh, one of the, of the biggest war with the, the, Germany, the German people. And that first paper was from German lawyer after the war, after the war and, and the paper was on how can we work together now, now that the war is over, how can we create peace through economics? The first book I discovered was a book from a Belgian, uh, a Belgium guy, uh, the first one on the left hand side. Uh, the, book, the name of the book is Pax Economica in Latin. Pax Economica, it's of course economic peace. And that guy was an economist, but also a CEO of a, of a company. And in 1910, just before uh, World War I, that guy said, we are in, a quite good economic context, uh, context, but I can feel some very tiny for tiny things that could tell me that if we continue that way, there is the danger of war. As you know, he was he was right because uh, he wrote he wrote his book between 19 and 10, and he finished it in 1913, and the and the book was published in in 20. The second one was an, uh, an economist, a French economist, Henri Heuser. Um, he was a specialist of, um, of the taxes aspect between, between countries. But in his introduction in 1935, that guy, that guy said, we are in an economic crisis. Uh, there is a lot of unemployment. There is a lot of immigration in Europe and we are in difficulty because of that immigration. Most of the countries of Europe are trying to push to, to, to become or to become populist countries. If we continue that way, certainly we will go to a war. If you can imagine all those aspects, economic crisis, immigration, populism, and the war, uh, of course, it's, it's in our mind today uh, with what we are living here, especially in France. So in, in, in 2010, 27, I decided to write that book on economic peace. Um, just to, to spare time, I would like to say something that is very strong within our teams, and it's a big conviction. I don't know if it exists in English, I don't know if it exists in Japanese or in other languages, but at least in Latin, in Latin, civis passem parabellum means if you want peace, you have to be prepared for war. I don't know if it's the same in the US, but in France and in Europe, it's, it's a very strong um, assumption about life. What I could witness for this is as an ex fighter pilot, when you prepare yourself to war, after several years, you are not prepared to peace. That's impossible. Can you imagine to train someone to war? And can you imagine that after seven years being trained to kill? Because being a fighter pilot is just to be to be trained to kill. 
how can we imagine that by being trained to war, we will be ready for peace? So the conviction we have in this school is we have to develop a culture of peace in the business settings, in the business schools, in the university, in the engineering school, to ensure that our students will be ready to be the future of the companies, to be the future manager, the future leaders that will be able to think about an economy totally dedicated to the common good, to peace, to sustainability, and not dedicated only to be number one in the world. Of course, there is a lot of resistance between people, a lot of resistance within companies, a lot of resistance within the CEOs and managers, just for one thing. They were totally trained to be fighters. And when you are trained to be fighters, when you are a good CEO, when you are a good manager, when you, we, you are in charge of a company, and that the, the economic model of that company is to create profit as an end, it's very difficult to accept that you can have that kind of, of, of switch in your mind. Um, if I just speak about one or two of those resistance, I, I will speak about man is a wolf for man because many people know that one. Um, at least in Europe, those people say that, you know, you have this uh, English philosopher Hobbes, who say that man is a wolf for man, and that's, uh, and that's a clue. We have to take care about the other, and we, if we want to achieve something, we, we have to prepare for war. What I try to say to managers, CEOs, and what we are trying to do as researchers is to work with psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, just to be able to put evidence on the table that never Hobbes said exactly man is a wolf for man. Effectively, in one of his books, he said sometimes people are sacred for the other, sometimes they are dangerous for the other. And that's life. I'm okay with this. I have to take care because if I, if I do not know someone, perhaps it's a danger, but the best solution I have to make that danger decrease is to be in relation with them, is to try to, to, to share something with them and not to think immediately that I have to take care and I have to be prepared for war. I just would like to share with you this slide because the slide is speaking uh, about the different partners we have. Uh, the center is totally financed by those partners. It's, it's, it's actually an endowed chair, and they give us money. They give us donation to help us to do our job as a researcher. Um, there is 20 to 21. I didn't make the count yesterday. Uh, today, there are only 13. Some of them disappeared in the story, but uh, the first very great achievement for us we, we had is among the five um, founding members of the, of the research center, you have Arimont, Boloff, Udimek, Hewlett Packard. Among them, four of them are still there after 10 years, and they just signed again for a three more year period. And the others are with us for two of them for the last year and the other between six and, and nine years. Uh, the question is not to, telling you, to tell you that you are good people, but the question is just to tell you that when we are trying to speak about peace with, with CEOs and with company, um, they are here, they are okay. They want to speak about peace. They want to be able to speak that their company is just a company uh, that was created to do money, but a company that was created to give services, to give uh, products, and to give money to the civil society and to help us to live together. So uh, here you have some building blocks uh, about economic peace. The first one is to say that life is above all relationships and life is not competition. We are in 
in a time frame we are in, in, in a specific moment in history in which we want to convince people we want to share with our children that if they want to achieve they have to be the best they have to be the best competitors they have to be the strongest they have to hide their own fragilities their sensitive sensitivity their, their abilities. but what we are pushing in front of the stage is exactly the opposite if we want to achieve something we have to think about the group and the collective aspect and the relationship and of course the first person we have to be linked with is ourselves. the reason why we integrated mindfulness in our research center is to say mindfulness is not speaking about well-being mindfulness is speaking about being in a relationship with someone and the first person is me is myself i have i have to do that first transformation job to be able to think again about how am I an emotional guy? How am I able to be linked with others? How am I able to, uh, how to say that in English, to have difficulties when I am in front of a situation? And how can I share that with the other? Because all of those things, what I achieved and, and the situation in, in which I failed, it's myself. It's what I can give to the world to contribute to the common good. Uh, another building blocks for us is, can we imagine to switch from a vision of the world uh, that is only a world of exploitation to a vision of the world that is a world of relationship? Um, from here in Europe, in the history, every time you have a small place, a time, something you can have the only vision is how can i exploit that how can i make money with this what we would like to push again in front of the stage is how can we consider that the the whole world i'm not speaking only about the planet but about the people about the animals and so on how can we imagine the whole world as a kind of political subject and not just an object of, of explo exploitation. A political subject which will have the right to say something and to say, I want or I don't want, I, I would like to participate, I would like you to respect me. The third building blocks is uh, the aim of our life of our life is not competition. The aim of life is distance, is being together and live together. Uh, those three aspects are, are for me very important because if people do not accept, if people are not aligned with these three aspects, that will be that will be certainly difficult to speak about economic peace, and certainly they will request from us to convince them that peace is important. And what we decided in our research center is we are not here to convince; we are just here to give people some clue. We are here to to make our job and to share what we discover about life, about peace, about relationships, just to give them the opportunity to, to, to transform them, themselves, but not to convince. So uh, what is economic peace? Um, just to tell you something that was very important in the center is, when I proposed to the board of the school to speak about economic peace, the first reaction of that board was, can you give us a definition of economic peace? I was not able to do that. I was really not able to give them a definition because if you go to, to the literature, you will see that there is almost nothing about economic peace. We wrote two, two papers last week uh, in the Journal of Business Ethics and in the French Journal of, uh, of uh, economics philosophy, but there is very, very few things about that. So my first answer was that economic peace is not initially a concept of, of economy, but uh, a concept that could say that because economy is today what we call uh, a total actor of life, an actor that is influencing everything in our life, education, research, politics, nature, sports, arts, everything is under the control of economy. 
And because everything is under the control of the economy, we can have uh, two different kinds of position. The first one could be to fight against the economy. It's not what we choose. And the other one is to say, what can we do with the business settings? What can we do with the economy just to try to change this and to imagine that the economy can go back to its first position and that position was to contribute to the common good and to contribute to the development of the flourishing of people. <clears throat> we decided with the CEOs, with the, the founding members of the centers to have these uh, three different aspects of a code of ethics. The first one was the respect of life in all its form. It's not a moral code. We are not here to say this one is good, this one is bad. That's not the, the, the idea. The, the idea is just to say, can we draw, <clears throat> can we draw lines? And can we share these lines with people to help them to question themselves as manager, as employees, as CEO, to decide if their decision, if their actions are correct or, or not in their own point of view when they want to contribute to peace. So the first one is respect for with respect sorry, of life in all its form. The second one is respect of human dignity, reduction of poverty, inequality, and personal development. Uh, for example, for the, the second one, the, um, the International Labor Office contacted us a few weeks ago because they want to work on that question. The question is, um, how could we transform the way um, the international purchasing activity has an impact on, um, on the slavery of people, on the slavery of children. There is a direct link between the economic, the international economic life and, uh, and slavery and, and the labor of, of young children. The last aspect was the first thing the CEOs told us when we started the first meeting with the group. And that aspect was, we are convinced as CEO that a company is, uh, the aim of a company is to be embedded in, this, in the civil society, to strengthen the social fabric and to contribute to the common good. That was a terrific sentence when, when I heard that. I was totally aligned with this. I was smiling when they told that to us. And we decided to keep it at the third aspect of the code of ethics. And you can imagine also, even if it seemed certainly a kind of uh, evidence of peace for many CEOs, uh, it's very difficult to understand that because the name of the company, when I say to CEOs, actually, I could say also for many students in a business school. If you ask a student in a business school what is the aim of a company today, even in, Gren in Grenoble, they will certainly tell you the aim of a company is to make money, is not to contribute to the, the common dude, is not to contribute to the strengthening of the social fabric. That's the aim we choose at that moment. <clears throat> uh, I hope I am still in, in, the, in the time. Another, the conception of a company is also different if we are trying to speak about economic peace, because the question is, is a company an economical entity with a social engine, or is a company a social entity with an economic engine? Of course, in economic peace, it's the second aspect that is important. I'm sorry, I will accelerate a, a little bit more, but uh, here again, what is the aim of the company? Is the aim of the company to make profit or Profit is just a solution to increase wealth, to increase well-being, and to increase the social fabric. That's also totally different. When one of our partners, uh, who was at that moment trying to choose which place will be the best in India to implement my next uh, my next plans, when he decided to to choose at the main. Um, uh, at the main value of the of the decision making process that the place in which that that plant must be implemented is the place in which the plants will contribute correctly and most effectively to the life of the people around the plants when he decided to choose this that was for me a very good information about the way and the the, the, the switch 
uh, that was in, in progress in his own mind as a CEO. So again, what is economic peace? Oh, I forgot something, sorry. Um, during the first four to five years, I really do not remember that was forbidden to the, in the centers, that was forbidden for the research show to try to define what is economic peace. What I wanted them to do is just to accept that in this plane, in, in this place, sorry, during that time with the other researcher, with the managers and with the CEO, we were there together just to take time, just to slow down and just to make things happen and to let peace and economic peace occur from what we were speaking about, from the event we were, we were able to set up together, the research we were able to wrote down. And the main idea was we will speak about a definition about economic peace just when we will be able to say that's what is happening in the world when people try to promote peace instead of hyper-competition. So in the center, we have three main research axes, and, and perhaps I will stop on the next slide. The first axis is uh, the intimate of the people. I, I call it here mindfulness, but let's say the intimate of the people or uh, the inner peace, peace as a, what we said, peace as a foundation. And the reason why we wanted to work on the, on the inner aspect of people is certainly something easy to understand. If I want to be able to be the leader of uh, those, this kind of transformation in my company to, to go from a very competitive to a very peaceful company, certainly I have to do something with myself. And, and the first transformation must be within myself before being outside of myself. Uh, the first axis is feeding the second one. And the second one is speaking about the collective peace and the interrelational peace with uh, a way in, and that way in is uh, what are my postures when I am trying to create context? And the way out is how can we imagine another managerial culture in this company if, if we want that company to promote peace? The second axis is feeding the last one, and the last one is uh, what we call the flourishing of all the stakeholders. Uh, if I give you just three examples of the study we tried to, to promote in these three axes. If I'm speaking about the first one, of course, we, we wrote a lot of things around mindfulness and mindfulness at work. Uh, what I could say here, just uh, uh, the short uh, aspect of that work, that is, again, mindfulness is not for well-being initially. Well-being will be an output of the work, but mindfulness is there just to create other kind of relationship with myself, with the other, with the stakeholders, and also to develop the opportunity to be able and to be secure enough, to feel safe enough to have the opportunity and the authorization to say no, to say, I don't agree, and to contribute correctly to my job because I feel safe. And I know that now it's not only a possibility to say no, but it's also a kind of commitment. Uh, Hewlett Packard, the company, the, the, the computer company, decided to work on mindfulness for the last 10 years. Actually, the, the program is still, is still running. In the second axis, one of the company, the group Raymond, decided to work on the concept of, um, so I forgot the name of the concept now, a servant leadership. Uh, servant leadership from, from Greenleaf, uh, the, the US researcher from the, the 80s. Uh, they created their own program and the main idea was it's, it's a 150 years company. And their aim at the start of the, uh, of the, at the, start, sorry, of the process was, can we change the culture and the climate within the company? It's a very vertical, it's a very um, old way of doing business. Uh, we won't like to have something more collaborative. Again, the process is still running. Um, 
And in the last acts, that is the flourishing of all the stakeholders, I can give you two different examples, and I will stop there to start the question. The first example is one of our colleagues who is a specialist of the, the supply chain is working with this topic. And the topic is how can we change the culture of the purchasing people to switch from a very aggressive or cost killer culture to a peaceful culture? How can we educate people? How can we educate supplier to think about creating value, value before thinking about decreasing the price of things. And the last example is what we call uh, economic peace territory. We tried two experimental uh, events here in France with a, what we call a department, it's a, a district. Uh, and in this district, we were engaged by uh, the central administration with the local administration and private company. And the main topic was how can we attract people to stay in this place? It's not, it's not a very renowned place. And the company said, we, are, we have difficulty to attract people. We have difficulties to keep people. The local administration and the central administration say exactly the same, not for the same reason, but how can we attract, uh, let's say, medical doctors? How can we attract other specialists to make this country live? Uh, and um, so the job was to make them work together, think and work together on how can we imagine a place, a territory in which the common good and peace could be the main, um, the main trigger. Uh, perhaps I will stop there. I have still a lot of things to say, but uh, time is running and I think I, I speak a little bit too much. On the contrary, uh, Dr. Staler, I thought your, your remarks were fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate uh, your having offered um, what I think is a, is a, is a, is a um, unfortunately still somewhat unique perspective, but it's very clear from your remarks that this is an idea that has been developing and been um, getting increasing purchase over time. So I look forward to, to hearing more about that in the Q&A. Um, speaking of the Q&A, just a reminder, folks, you can begin putting your questions in the Q&A dialog box, or if you would like to save it and pose your question directly verbally, you'll have the opportunity to do that as well. Um, at this point in the proceedings, however, before we get to the Q&A, I would like to pass things over to Nishitane Sensei to offer uh, five or 10 minutes of prepared remarks and comments uh, responding to this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Before I joined Kobe University 10 years ago, actually I was a member of Hiroshima University and the Kaneko Sensei was my boss at the moment. Anyway, I thank to have this opportunity to comment on Professor Steyler's amazing presentation. Today, I will comment on his presentation from the view of sustainability management. Sustainability management is a management that takes social and environmental issues into consideration. And it is the same as what was previously called environmental management or CSR management. Firms have been working on sustainability management since the 1990s, but they are currently required to work even harder to achieve the SDG. The sustainability management is mainly studied in the field of economics and the business administration. In economics, sustainability management is regarded as business means for profit. And in business administration, it is regarded as a means to obtain social support for a farm survival. In the latter case, in other words, it can be said the emphasis phrases is on harmony with society. In terms of resolving social and environmental issues, it may be more desirable to have a perspective of business administration that presupposes harmony with society. But in practice, there is a tendency 
to emphasize it more on economic value. Professor Steiler's view is actually, in my understanding, economy has come close to sustainability. However, my view is that sustainability has also come close to economy. For example, the concept of creating shared value, CSV, that was advocated by Professor Michael Porter at Harvard Business School, is getting popular. CSV aims to pursue corporate profit while contributing to society through main business. For that reason, it is also called strategic CSR as another name. On the other hand, CSV can be interpreted as simply CSR through the main business. So it can be interpreted that it does not necessarily emphasize only economic value. However, the resulting economic value is not denied. In my understanding, the concept of economic peace is very related to the concept of CSV, especially, especially as uh, CSR through the main business. I totally agree with economic peace and CSV as CSR through the main business. In contrast, some experts say social and environmental issues should be resolved by the original CSV that emphasizes economic aspect, because these issues cannot be resolved by social responsibility alone. However, in response to such an idea, the question arises as to whether the original CSV that emphasizes more on economic aspects can really resolve social and environmental issues. Please see this figure that categorizes the relationship between environmental and social aspect and the economic aspect. The original CSV assumes that the social and environmental aspect and the economic aspects are win-win. But their relationship is not limited to win-win. For firms, that value more on the economy, the lower right corner, where social and environmental aspects and economic aspects are lose win. win. Can be an option. And the upper left corner, where it is win lose, is not selected. That is, if social and environmental aspects and economic aspects are win-win, that is the most desirable, but not always. Accordingly, when working on resolving social and environmental issues by CSV, if economic value is overemphasized, social and environmental issues may not be fully resolved. I don't deny the win-win relationship. Rather, I think it is most desirable if such a relationship can be actually established. However, on the other hand, the win-win relationship alone is not sufficient to resolve the social and environmental issues. So I think it is necessary to consider other relationships for the purpose as well. Accordingly, the what required are measures to expand the win-win pie, measures to migrate win-lose and lose-win to win-win, and measures to enable to work on even with win-lose. Today, I don't discuss how to implement these measures. However, I consider 
the concept of economic peace is very helpful to consider how to implement these measures. Therefore, I expect this concept will encourage firms to implement these measures and this contribute to the sustainable development. That's all of my comments on his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nishitani Sensei, um, for those for those uh, excellent remarks and responses, uh, and for grounding some of it, I think, in 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 a tradition of kind of the business literature that 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 dovetails nicely with, I think, a a the the development of kind of an ethic of corporate social responsibility, but then also I, I think does a good job of incorporating some of these new concepts that we've been introduced to today. Um, so thank you to both of you for your remarks. We have about 10 minutes left for question and answer. I have questions of my own, but I'm going to defer to the queue at uh, first. So um, we have one question in the queue um, and I'll go ahead and read it for those of you who are not looking at it. Thank you, Professor Styler, for your lecture. The last part reminded me of system leadership discussion, Ledbetter et al, and wise and ethical leadership by Hicks and Waddock. My current research focuses on peace building through business or business for peace, B for P. Has your center done any research related to this aspect, for example, businesses to contribute to societies affected by armed conflict? So specifically, I guess, applying these concepts to, to um, in, countries in conflict and post-conflict societies. Thank you for that question. Mm. I, I just would like to be sure, can you rephrase that a little bit slower, please, for me, just to I, be sure that I understood correctly the question. Yes, so, so what the, the, uh, the, the question that is being asked here has to do with, I guess, a parallel line of thinking a related line of thinking that is uh, business for peace. Uh, so using the private sector as an engine, not just for restarting economic growth in conflict affected societies, but also building peace and addressing the root causes of conflict uh, to prevent right. conflict recurrence. Um, has your center kind of done research on applying the principles that you're describing to management um, in, the co in, in societies that are affected by armed conflict or post-conflict societies? Yes. Yes, of course, there is a parallel with business for peace. Uh, what we are trying to promote is um, different kind of things. The first one is certainly the question of education. Uh, we are in a culture, at least here in, in the Western country, we are in a culture in which most of the people think that the first and the biggest competence we have to develop in our children is the ability to cope with conflict. What we are trying to promote is the ability to flourish and the ability to develop a culture of peace. Um, of course, we are trying to do that from a business school. And it's really difficult from a business school, from the higher education, to try to convince and to push people from the lower education to work with us. We are just started uh, a small experimental project. We call that project um, Ambassador for Peace, Young Ambassador for Peace. Uh, it's a long-term process and, and it's a long-term idea. And that long-term idea is if really we want in the future having companies with CEOs and with managers able to deal differently with the business settings and not only to think about the business settings as a place to to compete, but also as a place to share something, we have to start very early in the process. One of my one of my observation as a professor in the in the in the higher education could be, wow, at least eighty to ninety students, ninety percent of the students we have here we have here in the business schools are totally under stress for their future. How is it possible? We are in a privileged country. We are in a privileged high school. We are there with people who are coming from privileged families and they are so stressed, so, so anxious about their future. How can we imagine that we will have people in charge in, in the midterm process when, when those students will become CEOs? How can we imagine that this education in which they are under stress, they are under anxiety will help them will educate them to be people able to develop peace 
within the business. So one of our aim is to say that we have to work on the long-term process. We have to work on the medium process and we have to work today with company on the very short-term operational process. Uh, and this is a link. Uh, when when uh, Sensei uh, Nishitani was speaking, I, I just had a read on one of the comments in the discussion. And the comment that uh, when you are at war, when you are in a country in which it's very difficult, the opposite of threats, because um, this person, Ruth, Ruth was speaking about uh, Zambia. So when you are in this kind of country, how can you promote economic peace? And my first answer is, it's not possible. When you are struggling for life, it's not possible to promote economic peace. What we think is economic peace is a kind of preventive process, a kind of cultural process. And if really we want to imagine that one time people promote peace instead of competition or war, we have to thinking on the long term. We have to imagine that um, instead of mathematics, perhaps the way I will deal with our emotion will be the core competencies we, we try to promote in the, in the early age of children. So there is something very difficult when we are speaking about economic peace because of course, having profitable, having sustainable companies, it's important. It's why we are trying to work on that point. But if really we want to promote that, it's not only by doing it on a daily basis on the very operational process within companies, but to think about the future and not today and not next week, but in, five years and also certainly in 50 years. Just one last comment. When Finland, Finland decided in the 60s to change their educating, uh, educating process, and they wrote down on the paper that what they wanted at that moment is, uh, I, I just try, I'm just trying to make the, the, the translation in my mind, but what they decided is they said, we want to do something in our education uh, process to ensure that our children will have the opportunity to be children, to have another opportunity later, perhaps to be good adults and to be able to contribute correctly with the, with the society. What we are trying here is not to have, to, to have the opportunity to, to give the opportunity to children to be children. We want them to be good adults. They have only five years old, but we want them to compete. We want them to win. We want them to fight. We want them to show us that they will be able to, to cope effectively with the difficulty of world. That's not a way of educating children. That's what we, what we want to do. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Staler, we're, we're running relatively short on time, but we have one more question. I'm very excited to hear your answer to this question because it was a question uh, that I had in mind uh, as well. Um, and it relates to, 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 the, to the cultural environment in which we are educating people, the broader cultural environment. The, you know, if, if, if we're training people to be competitors from early school work, which is something that you just referenced, and, and, and to select into the best schools at the, at these, at the tertiary or business school kind of level, how is it that we go about creating systemic change? Is it one corporate culture at a time? Are there things that can be done at the level of business education, um, broadly speaking, uh, that, that, that can be done to, to facilitate this process and move it along? Hmm. If I quickly understand you, what my answer could be, um, it's a French expression, we, we, will, we will do this attempt to go in the house by the door by the window by the by the roof and we will try to work in any ways that's possible for us to do something initially as uh, as professor in the business school most most of the people are expecting from us to work with companies and to do research with the companies and economics but we are working with the spiritual uh, world we are working with uh, the early children we are working with the politicians we are working with the agricultural world. We are working with a lot of people because we think that life is only a relationship and that the question of economy is not just a question of economics. 
it's a question of life and, and a question for the civil society. And another aspect of your question is, uh, how can we imagine to change? And suddenly this is different in Japan than in France, for example, because we are speaking uh, with you from Japan, from France, but to Japan, sorry. But here in the Western country, one of the software we have in mind is to be good, we have to achieve something. We have a name and we have to prove that we are able to, um, to reach that aim. I think if we want to speak about peace, that's not a good idea. The good idea is not to be able to achieve something. The good idea is to answer the question, how can I contribute? And if I can contribute only to a very small part of economy, to a very small part of life, that's okay, that's great. The question is not to push the young children to be world champion. The question is to push the young children to be able to answer at a certain time to the question of on what aspect of life, of the civil society, of my life, of my family life, my, 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 my nation life, on what aspect do I want to contribute? If I want to be a CEO, that's great. If I want to be an artist, that's great. But the question is not to achieve, it's just to be on, on the way. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Staler. And I can, I, can, I can say from reading the comments in the chat that um, I think that this idea has a lot of purchase because it's being pursued, similar ideas are being pursued in parallel here at Hiroshima University, uh, but then also in Zambia as well. So this is an idea sure. uh, whose, whose time has come. Uh, unfortunately, our time has, has also come uh, to a close, that is. Um, thank you all for joining us today for this extremely edifying um, uh, presentation. And please join me in, in expressing our thanks to Dr. Staler and Nishitani uh, Sensei for their remarks. And thank you all again for joining us here at the NERPS webinar. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very much. <laughs>